Hello. Hi. Welcome to the podcast. On this episode, we're talking to a new friend of ours, J.P. Dubay. So J.P. is a professor of marketing at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, and he teaches a class there to the MBA students on pricing. This conversation was all about price optimization and how you can test to get to that optimal price and about how a lot of companies think that financial that price is a financial decision where actually it is a marketing decision exactly so rather than just adding a markup on top of your cost if you're a product actually kind of understanding um, through testing what the optimal price is you might surprise yourself you might be losing a lot of money on the table because you don't know what the demand is going to be for the product at a given price and how much profit you're leaving on the table so it's a great conversation if you're watching this on youtube it's coming right up but uh enjoy the show enjoy the show so tomorrow i actually have another it's my third now um meeting with the city of chicago controller to use some of the tools we applied to ZipRecruiter. Um, I can't remember my workbox thing. Did we get into the personalized pricing there? I think we did. Yeah. Didn't we? Yeah. 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 So I'm going to try, I want to use a similar kind of AI to try and help the city of Chicago start personalizing tickets and fines to help people who are in dis, you know, financially disadvantaged avoid delinquency. Yeah. 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 I know all that stuff is just absolutely so fascinating because it, it makes so much sense. But then at the same time, you know, you're fighting up this like uphill battle with what people think is fair about it and and like i know i know just knowing our mother that she would definitely not think that the price scale going up and down would be fair but think oh, about especially. the following talk to a city official why do we have why do we have speeding tickets why do we have fines if you don't pay your registration fee and whatever the idea is to discourage people from engaging in a bad act so let's suppose if you're doing 20 miles over the speed limit you get a hundred dollar fine for somebody who's making 500000 a year, $100 fine is nothing, right? Fine, I pay it, yeah. right? In fact, I might pay $500 as a subscription to have an unlimited driver's license or a speeding <laughs> limit, right? I might yeah. even pay a lot more. Given my commute, I might pay a few thousand dollars a year to be allowed to drive at whatever speed I wanted, right? Yeah, but right. for somebody who's making below the poverty line, these are people who don't have enough emergency cash reserves to go more, go more than two weeks without any income. So now right. imagine you get slapped with a hundred dollar fine. The Fed did a report. It's shocking how unprepared the majority of American households are for an emergency. So a hundred dollar right. fine is devastating. You don't need to charge someone a hundred bucks to get the point across. And that's exactly why fines in the, in the state of Illinois, and we're supposed to be super, like super socialist. If you listen to the Republicans, we're one right. of the super socialist states and we have a very regressive approach for deterring people from those kinds of bad acts. But these are not crimes. These are moving violations. So, right. so what's been happening since 2013 is we've got mass delinquency problems. You can actually see in the data that in poor neighborhoods that chapter 11, uh, chapter 13, excuse me, personal bankruptcies have gone up in response to raising fines and fees. Unemployment has gone up. And although there's no statistical proof for it, um, there's suggestive evidence that things like um, uh, homelessness goes up as well. Because mm -hmm. you get slapped with a $100 fine, you then have to go, you, get, you don't pay it because you can't afford it. You end up having to go to court, you miss work, you lose your job. Um, you, you, they start clawing it up by the way, right? If you don't pay on time, then the fines and fees can double your amount. So it suddenly goes to 200 court fees, eventually people sometimes end up in jail. Yeah. yeah. And that's how you lose your job, how you lose your home. And then getting a new job is very difficult. Now right. you've got a criminal record because you were in jail. All right. because you didn't, all because you didn't pay the $50 fee, your, your parking ticket or whatever. And why didn't you pay it? Because I didn't have $50. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then the cycle continues over and over again. And then, you know, people that families that are in poverty can't get out because of all these different, um, um, you know, different situations that they find themselves in. So we're in conversation with JP Dubay. JP, we usually start off with you giving us a little information about, you know, who you are and what you do. Sure, absolutely. So I'm a professor of marketing at the University of Chicago. I've been working at the Booth School of Business now for I'm going into my 21st year there. But my background as marketing professor is a little unusual because my PhD was in economics, in particular in the area of antitrust economics and how things like mergers and other kinds of anti potentially anti-competitive uh, activities can disrupt the functioning of a market and potentially lead to higher prices and ultimately to harm to consumers or customers. 
And so in the field of marketing, what I've been doing for the last 20 years is applying the toolkit, uh, which is a theoretical and an empirical toolkit that I was trained for in economics. But instead of applying it to antitrust issues, I've been applying it to marketing issues. So that same toolkit for analyzing a merger can be used to evaluate the pricing opportunity for a company and to think about how that pricing opportunity is influenced by competitive factors, such as somebody else who's selling a, a different brand, but that competes directly against yours. And similarly, the toolkit can be used to look at marketing decisions, new product decisions. So in a nutshell, it's about using quantitative methods from economics to help make better marketing decisions. And I guess the timing was somewhat serendipitous because my career began right around this inflection point where companies suddenly had this massive access to customer data, which meant besides being able to apply these tools in certain very large scale situations, it started to become increasingly possible to use these tools even for smaller firms, especially digital firms, that whether they realized it or not, were digitally recording every single interaction they had with a customer. Mm. So as we fast forward 20 years later, um, my experiences have gone way beyond working with the large kind of firms that would be involved in mergers, you know, companies like Coca-Cola or Budweiser Beer, and working with small digital startups who now have access to lots of customer information and can apply the same toolkit to make better decisions at the very formative stages of their company. Yeah. Yeah. So that was all fantastic. I didn't know about the, the back. I knew the background in economics, but the, the way that you're applying it for antitrust, which I mean, oh, we yeah, could, right. we go, we go off on that because uh, you know, the we're very antitrust, we're very antitrust. Well, <laughs> I, at the, at the end of the day, right. When people, um, you know, tends you know conservatism and everything tends to you know reference the invisible hand right to help balance out the economy right and make sure that prices stay. But what's ended up happening is that this invisible hand no longer exists. It, it can't because people are buying up their competition, and then all of a sudden there's mm -hmm. nothing there to balance it out. It's like okay, well I can only get electricity, and this is just like the first thing that popped my head. I can only get electricity from ComEd. Like I really don't have and any other way for me to get electricity. We do, we bought um, solar panels at our, our parents' house has solar panels. So we're going to be off the grid soon, as soon as we get up there and install them essentially, right? But not many people are gonna go and spend $10,000 on not solar right. panels to do that. So the not competition to, is- Not to mention that the city puts up a bunch of red tape. Oh for, my God. So you geez. can't put up solar panels <laughs> unless they're on it's the top ridiculous. Of your like, roof and you know, because it was it, they're on the garage, right? So we built this garage to angle towards the sun, so it has maximum exposure throughout the entire day, right? Now we we had to cut, jump through like so many different hoops just because it was on a different angle than it didn't look like a normal garage. We had a it was like it was probably like three months to find a garage builder that would build it the way to the specifications that we came up with because we're like that's not how garages are supposed to look. And then on top of that, with the permits and everything and people not calling you back, your alderman's going like, well, you know, the it's statute like, you know, says. You would imagine that any alderman in the city would be like, oh, yeah, one of my people wants to put up uh, solar panels. I want to be a part of that. But, you right. know, yeah, it's just, sure. but I, have it's, a, I, have a, I have a new study that's going to be I'm going to be posting this paper online in the next few days. So that it's somewhat timely for this conversation. It's about craft beer. And, mm -hmm. you know, to your point about is competition diminishing and is this a result of capitalism failing us in some way? And I'm actually a very staunch defender of capitalism. I think markets work terrifically well. The problems usually are government and people's interference with the market that distorts capitalism. It's sort of an irony that when, when sort of anti-capitalist sentiment has entered how we make policies re to, related to markets, that we often disrupt things in the ways that are the most harmful to us in the long run. So these are well-intentioned acts in the short run, Bad, they're bad outcomes in the long term. But one of these, and, and you really nailed it, is a much more lax stance on mergers. So here, let me come to my craft beer and I'll, and I'll try and put this to give you a data point. I think you'll, this will be something you'll, you'll like. Um, so since 2004, craft beer in the U.S. has gone from being a niche phenomenon to becoming approximately 20% of the U.S. beer market. Right? That is, as I'm, I'm focusing here on take home, like what you buy at the liquor store, grocery store, et cetera. Right? Mm. So craft beer has been around since the late 1970s when Jimmy Carter deregulated brewing, the brewing industry. He, he legalized home brewing. And then over the 80s and 90s, different states started permitting brew pubs and so forth. So there's been access to craft beer for a long time. 
But what's really happened in the, in the 2000s with the rise, especially of the internet, has been the ability for small companies, startups, to do direct-to-consumer selling you know, without needing to go through the expensive distribution channel of you know, supplying physical stores. But more than that is digital advertising. I can set up a website, I can generate awareness, and I don't need to buy a single network ad, right? So mm -hmm. buying te television ads on NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, super expensive. And I honestly think that's one of the reasons why for, for almost a century, we increasingly had access only to very mass produced lager beer where two to three companies controlled almost 99% of the beer we were buying. No joke, yeah. right? I mean, it's humongous concentration. So craft beer should have been your dream come true, especially in the mid 2000s when the Brewing Association got together and created an official craft designation. We see a takeoff. And again, mm -hmm. 2006, craft beer is approximately 3% of the market. By 2018, it's almost 20%, right? And yeah. now we're in the 2020, we're hovering around 20%. That is massive. And you would think the big brewers would be trembling over this. And it's not just craft beer, by the way. There's We have Greek yogurt. You know, you can find lots of examples in other categories where craft, artisanal, if you will, sorry for mm -hmm. the air quotes, are mm -hmm. slowly displacing the big established incumbent brands. So... At first glance, and this is what we see in the data, concentration, like market concentration amongst brands has been falling since 2005. This is good news. So the Budweiser brand, the Miller brand, they have less market share. Miller Lite, Bud Lite, they're falling, right? Their market shares are falling. And even collectively, if you take all the Budweiser products collectively, they now represent a much smaller chunk of US beer sold. But back to your point, the craft beer market is not displacing the incumbent brewers because the macro brewers since the about the last 10 years, especially, but let's say last 15 years have been gradually acquiring some of the biggest and most successful craft startups. You know, one of the most highly visible ones would have been, of course, the acquisition of, of Goose Island here in Chicago when they sold their assets to, to Anheuser-Busch. Um, many people view that as a betrayal or sellout. I mean, but the fact is, they're entrepreneurs like everyone else. And the whole right. essence of capitalism is, I'm going to start a new business, take a lot of risk, because if I succeed, then I get to reap the rewards, right? Right. And selling your assets is probably the biggest ROI to a young <laughs> entrepreneur, unless they want to run this company until their death, right? right and you right, know, right. there's a lot of, a lot of good reasons not to want to be a CEO until the day of your death, right? Won't we'll yeah. get into that now, but it's hard work. But the bottom line is we're not seeing the crap. We're not seeing the macro brewers losing market share because they're just gobbling up all of the competition. So yeah. competition hasn't really become more ferocious for Anheuser-Busch. It's just that the way they generate revenue is becoming increasingly like, diversified across brands that they didn't invent. Yeah, as opposed right. to the old days where you made your rewards off the brands you did invent. So now let's come back to what stimulated this, convert, this thread here. Imagine we had a much tougher stance against mergers. We might see an, a brewing industry that has a lot more price competition. Mm, yeah because craft brewers would be getting big now. There'd be no recourse to selling to the established firms. You could always sell to a private equity company or something of those likes, but they would have way less willingness to pay because Anheuser-Busch's willingness to pay isn't just based on, you have a great and viable product, but by owning and managing your product, I can avoid having to compete against you because now it's I'm competing against myself. Right, yeah, and that's, right. And that's what softens competition. Uh, having a private equity led uh, management team uh, would still make the market competitive because they're still competing against Anheuser-Busch and vice versa. Right. So did capitalism fail? No, on the opposite, capitalism did exactly what it's supposed to. We get to drink a lot of new beers now because once we deregulated and allowed the market to function correctly, suddenly variety sort of swooped, swooped over the market and the consumer benefits. Where the consumer is not fully getting the benefits is because we're allowing companies to monopolize through acquisition. Yeah. Yeah, right. And and a lot of that too when we when we hear when you said that it was like a betrayal, you know, Goose Island decided that they weren't going to yeah. um, you know, be independent anymore. I felt that. Yeah. I was like that was a betrayal. Yeah. Like they had to stick it out. They got to go. But then when you also yeah. like they're entrepreneurs, too. And, and then yeah, I'm right. sitting here thinking about our tech idea that we're at Workbox with. Yeah, and right. I'm like, yeah, I I've already scouted out, you know, like what the potential competition is going to be. But honestly, the potential competition will be potential acquirers. You know, there like those are the people. 
barrel aged stout and selling out the story oh, of goose island there you go oh <laughs> <laughs> you can see what my reading has been over the last little yeah. while i have yeah, a lot of beer go. books here <laughs> and, and and essentially what i've heard from you saying is that if if um if anheuser busch and all these big companies didn't end up acquiring all these things we would be able to get great beer for a lower price which i have to say possibly <laughs> yeah it's quite it's quite possible i mean you you have to be very careful to make to 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 make what I would call counterfactual predictions, these sort of but for the merger, what would the world look like? But yeah, my first instinct would be it would be more competitive um, and we might pay lower prices. Having said that, and here's, I guess I'm gonna, because I'm a pro market person, I like to play devil's advocate because I don't think the world is as black and white as we sometimes wish it was. Let's imagine we didn't allow mergers and acquisitions to happen, right? Or at a minimum, we were super strict about which ones were approved, including the acquisition of small startups. Would we have the same amount of variety? It's hard to say. You know, it would. Um, it seems like most of these these mic these microbrewers started off as just folks like like you and me who just happened to love to love beer and wanted to create something. They'd start off them not wanting to make money, but actually wanting to brew something new. So these were artisans, but so they might have started these companies regardless. But the fact remains, the allure of being able to run a startup these days. And this is something that's very, very prevalent at the business school where I teach at the University of Chicago in the Booth School. There are a lot of students who want to get involved in startups. And part of the reason is the excitement of starting a business, making management decisions instead of having to wear a tie and spend 20 years getting to that point. You can do this right out of the blocks. But right. the other real allure, which nobody is nearly as frank about as they ought to be, is you could potentially make a lot of money. Yeah. Because the whole goal of these startups, most of the time, they talk about this is getting financing from a from a from venture capital or from angels right to, to get off the ground and then the exit strategy which is four to five years from now how are we going to sell this thing yeah yeah and if right. you tell people hey big brewers can't buy your startups anymore we might not have we might not have fewer craft beer breweries but they may never have become nearly as big because the allure of going national or going regional at least is probably stimulated in part by the knowledge hey if i can pull this off I can probably bring in, you know, a hundred million bucks, which is exactly right. what Goose Island did. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So in a world where we ban mergers, we might have way less variety of beer. I just don't know. Yeah. yeah. Right. 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 And right, it's, it's the two sides of the coin, especially. And I like what you said too, about the consumer benefits from this, from mm -hmm. the idea of, you know, like, you know, Jack and I start, uh, I was going to call it two brothers, but that's already brewery. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But but you could start you start a uh, 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 you know a brewery, and then you know like there's a there's a great company called Maplewood that is on Maplewood in Logan Square, I think. But they just started doing they they got into gin, and then they're making bourbon and stuff. And like, would that have happened if there wasn't that you know that allure to happen? And and we would be robbed as consumers not not having that. Right. Because there wouldn't be any incentive for them to go ahead and do that. So, this, yeah. so these are the short term and long term incentives. The short term incentive, I think, is for for a lot of these liquor, liquor and spirits and things. I think a lot of these are are granola type folks who love just the idea of making a new product. And they're kind of like artists. And well, they are. artists. I don't know why I said kind of like these are artists. <laughs> Yeah. And what made this happen now and why didn't it happen 30 years ago is it's much cheaper to launch a new product now. I can easily generate awareness. This is back to my points about the internet. I think the internet has been humongous for helping small companies get off the ground. And I think that's been a big factor. But there's a big difference between, you know, a small company saying, let's make bourbon now and we can generate enough awareness that we can sell enough bourbon so that we at least break even on this versus now let's get in the shelves of stores. Like, I mean, right. and, and I mean, like, I want to be in, I want to be on the shelves of like, you know, Safeway, right? I want Safeway selling my bourbon. That yeah. requires a very different, something very different. And actually scaling to that point runs the risk of compromising on some of the art. But yeah. the incentives to compromise and become big have got to be influenced largely by the allure of, I can sell this operation for a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. right. Exactly. Right. And so we've touched on it a little bit, but you just mentioned it again about how the internet and this massive um, opportunity for brands to grow and um, a little background. I don't, I'm not entirely sure how much you know about the, because we're in two different work areas because um, we're filmmakers. So we do brand storytelling um, and where those creatives that you mentioned in your, um, 
in your when we met you on uh, through Workbox and you gave this great speech about what the work that you did with price optimization for ZipRecruiter. Um, you know, it's like marketing right now to get like these little brands out there's such amazing opportunity, but there's a lot of crazy misinformation out there. And you had mentioned that like marketing shouldn't be solely in creative. And I don't know if we could agree more with that because what ends up happening is you have these marketing companies, boutique marketing companies that are just out there, you know, coming up with just generic, Oh, it's going to be like, you know, like we get, we get stigmatized all the time because we're like, Oh, we're your filmmakers. You're going to make me something really cool and really look amazing, but is it going to do anything? And I think the work that you're doing of understanding like, yeah, that data comes in, but the amount of stuff you can do with that data and how that can then influence the right. creative to actually make an impact and as, is huge. And, and, and as long as the creative, um, mind is a blank slate and not trying to find what they want to find in the data um, and actually hear what the data is saying. I feel like that's a, that's, that's really the next genesis of, of marketing and how you can actually, how it's like insight led creative because creativity unbounded comes up <clears throat> with nothing useful. Right. Um, it only comes up to useful for the creator that's creating it because that's what they wanted to create as opposed to, if you're doing it for a strategy, for a marketing, for advertising, to get your brand out there, it has to be insight. It has to be data-driven creative or led creative. And that's, and by the way, what you're describing, <clears throat> we're thinking of this, this is what marketing should be. Sadly, this becomes a cultural issue for most companies because there's a culture of how things are done. And I think maybe the word culture is a little bit exaggerated. There's a lot of inertia, but there's a way things are done there's a lot of inertia in the way things are done and then it just becomes the culture of how you solve a problem. So I'll give you an example. Um, without naming the company, a few years ago, I took a trek of students, M of M MBA students, to a bunch of companies. And one of the ones we visited is one of the largest consumer packaged goods companies in the US. Humongous company with a, rec a portfolio of consumer brands you would recognize. I'm sure you consume some of them. These are things you buy in supermarkets, et cetera. And we listened to their creative team tell us how they were trying to take a stat, these old brands and dust them off to make and freshen them up for the new generation. And there's some stuff about millennials and how millennials are different, blah, blah, blah. But, but at any rate, our students were really intrigued. So they started asking questions like, you know, how do you test this? How do you determine which creative is going to appeal to millennials? And these three brand managers, all of them were in their 50s. They're all, these are people who have decades of experience. They're in leadership positions when it comes to these creative decisions, started to laugh and dismissed the students and said, okay, you wanna talk about data. Well, obviously you guys are young, so let's explain, let me explain to you how it really works. Getting the data takes a lot of time, it's really expensive, and ultimately after wasting all that time and money, it just tells you what you already knew. Now, right. let's think about how consumer packaged goods brands are struggling these days to stay relevant, right? Now that same year is when I started doing collaborate, you know, started working on the side with Amazon. And one of the things I found really appealing about Amazon um, turns out to be that it's the antithesis of that culture. Amazon's culture is anytime somebody has an idea, they have to write a short document to prove and support their idea and then spell out how they would test it. And things at Amazon are incredibly evidence-based. That doesn't mean every time you want to do something, you have to stop and run an A-B test. This would be impractical. For, it's just not possible. But when you can't run an A-B test, you have to explain why. And then you have to start thinking, well, what's my alternative evidence? And what are the pros and cons of this? In other words, and this is the conversation every company should be having with their consulting firm before taking them seriously, is what was your evidence? Well, what was the theory that you were trying to, to, to guide you with this evidence? And here's a big one. What were the other methods and sources of evidence you might have used instead? And why didn't you? Yeah. And it's okay. And you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, hey, there's this other approach, it's better, but we chose not to do it because it would have been expensive. Or there's this other approach, it's better, but it would have taken three times as long. It's okay to say that. Just acknowledge the limitations of what you do and don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And so Amazon's killing it. I know it's a very divisive company and you might even want to go off on a tangent and think about what you like and dislike about Amazon. But what I love about Amazon and which makes me very bullish on the company in the long term is that they have a very scientific approach to decision making. And there's nothing wrong with gut instinct and creative on the opposite. That's highly encouraged. But at traditional established companies, it's almost like these artists, there's a culture where you don't even dare to question right. the artist. <laughs> 
Right. Well, one thing that we say all the time, and I, there's a couple of different things I want to touch on here, but one of the things we say all the time is with companies and branding and a lot of marketing that we hear or that we get t told to, they always go like, well, the first thing I do is I ask the client what they want to say, then I determine and figure out how to say it, and then we go to the audience. And the opposite should be true. The first thing you should try to figure out is what is the audience looking for you to like even say what, what are their opinions on a said product a type of product or anything else where are your competitors missing the opportunity right and then you back channel back up it's the old saying in corporate america you know the conversation will go from the ground up not from the top down right, right? but nobody the the way that they look at it is like oh well I have this amazing thing that's an amazing product it's the it's the thing that's going to change everybody's mind I just have to figure out how to say it and everybody will understand what I mean. And what really, that is very valuable. You should be able to, you know, yeah. understand your product, but you're missing a key component with the audience and understanding what is, what are they looking for? How can I really connect with them? Um, you know, and so what you said with the, especially with the data point, um, we recently just partnered up with uh, an insight guy in New York uh, named Tom Kennan, which he does deep listening. And so what his whole shtick is, is trying to understand using data and analyzing and understanding the in between the lines, right? What are people actually, what are they actual, what's the actual human condition here that your product service brand are solving for? And then- uh, that's, Yeah, that's the, that's the essence of the marketing problem. Marketing starts with the customer. And yeah. then the question, what problem am I helping the customer solve? And if you can't answer that question in a couple sentences, forget about a page or a paragraph, but in a couple sentences, if you can't tell me what problem your product is solving, how could you possibly know if you've priced it right? How could you possibly know <laughs> if you've messaged it right? Because you don't even know what it is you're selling. You don't right. know what value, because the problem that you're solving for the customer, that dictates the value. And then things right. like marketing, well, what do I want to tell someone to persuade them to buy? I should be telling them what problem I'm solving. If I don't know, yeah. then how could my messaging do anything? And if I'm right. trying to price that out and monetize it, I wouldn't even know what it is I'm monetizing. I actually don't know what someone should objectively be willing to pay for my product, let alone if the customer actually understands that. Right, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so that, that's like, that's this big struggle. And we run into it all the time, but all the time. And I, I don't want to equate it to, you know, solely on laziness, but it really is on the side of the brand saying, I don't want to think about this anymore. I just want you to go and do it. And people are just gobbling up cash from people right. that and isn't this goes, resulting this goes in back to the This goes back to the post-war period. So the way marketing worked from the post-war period all the way into the early 90s, there's a big event which changed things. But was there's this big ivory tower called marketing and because markets were becoming increasingly concentrated, you know, you had the big consumer packaged goods firms, the way it worked was the ivory tower threw by today's standards, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars a year at big national levels of advertising, mostly TV, but also radio and print, right? You threw money at the problem re related to the brand. And then because you basically own most of the shelf space, consumer went to the store and bought the brand you marketed. Yeah. And if you haven't heard of Marlboro Friday, I suggest learning about Marlboro Friday. But Marlboro Friday was when things suddenly pivoted because mm. all of a sudden the world's most valuable brand at the time in 1993, Marlboro was falling on all of the world's top brand lists, if you will, in terms of their commercial value. This is like as an intangible asset to a company. This was the best brand to own in terms of profitability. Had announced that in response to two years during which time private labels went from, these are generic cigarettes, went from about two to 3% of the category to over 20% of the category, Marlboro unveiled its plan and that was to cut its price 20%. Mm. And, and the, the, if you then read the details of Marlboro Friday, it turns out it wasn't that branding was dead, which is by the way, how the market reacted. So, small footnote, they lost $13.5 billion of market cap in half a day of trading after announcing this. <laughs> So this is humongous. Yeah, you, you, most people are forget Jesus. about Marlboro Friday. It's humongous. By the way, next day in the newspaper, the Marlboro man fell off his horse. Marketing is dead. The death of the branding era. Actually, it was the opposite. When yeah. Marlboro Friday implemented these price cuts, they complemented this with almost half a billion dollars of spending on what was called the Adventure Team campaign, where they did tons of not TV advertising, but point of sale marketing. And this is when CPG started to realize, hey, we, we got to pay attention to the customer. 
And marketing needs to be right in the store at the point of sale, whether it's, you know, how we organize our products on the shelf, mm. because it does matter, like how the brand, how the packs line up. Does, are they in your field of vision? Do they look nice when there's a whole bunch of them? Or are the colors really, are they annoying, right? Do they catch, do they grab your attention, but without rubbing you the wrong way? Do we have displays so that we can remind you, right? Um, when we run discounts, are these featured in the newspaper so you can be aware of it? And there's this whole array of things which I think we tend to call promotional marketing nowadays. But mm. that really was, in my opinion, not the, the end of, but the beginning of the branding era, where we actually tried to intercept the customer and be with them as a marketer all the way to the point where they put give their credit card to the cashier. Yeah. Yeah, right. Because marketing isn't just the isn't just the awareness. It's not just the ad that you buy. It's not just like we we're talking to a guy when he's talking about just sales funnel, right? And that's like his big, he, he tries to create that or he creates that sales funnel so that it's not just, oh, we're just going to go ahead and promotional everything, blah, 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 and then hope to figure that that it's eventually going to lead to a sale for these companies. It's like, no, this takes work. This is being in front of somebody. This is being consistent. This is, you know, if they if they clicked on, you know, your site once and then didn't come back, well, let's figure out why. You know, but and this then was, try but, to absolutely. But Marlboro Friday was almost 30 years ago, right? It was like 1993. Yeah. What devolves in the last 30 years, and the answer is plenty, is that besides recognizing that we need to track this funnel, as you just indicated, it sounds like your colleague also has understood that we can actually measure what's going on on the, all those stages so we can make sure, hey, at this particular piece here, I'm the funnel started here, goes all the way down here, but we're in the middle here there's an intervention I'm going to use. It may be some kind of a communication or some kind of interaction. I can test whether or not it did anything. Yeah, yeah. right. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and, and that's actually going to be, it's going to be new. Uh, the next one of the next podcast episodes going to be with this guy I just met on Tuesday that that's literally what he, it's, he's dive deep diving into, you know, like the actual data points of the consumer journey and trying to figure out, get, he doesn't trust Facebook insights saying that your ad did fantastic and everything else like that. He's like, let's actually let's figure out like what the best methods are for you specifically to then turn have a higher rate of of um, completion, which we can we're eventually going to dive into um, optimal pricing, <laughs> which yep, I'm sure, sure. We'll, we'll go off on because it, it's absolutely fa fascinating. But so that's going to be a future one. His name's Mike Mike something. I don't know what his last name is. It, we have to have we're having our second conversation with him tomorrow, but I'm sure that would be an interesting conversation for you to have because that is he is literally that's what he's trying to do. And when I when I was talking to him, I got excited. Just how I got excited when you were speaking, I was just like, oh, yay! <laughs> this is the people that are like understand this. Like there's there's something else out there. Um, well, and big and big big digital companies. What we're describing is standard fare now. This is not a new thing at all. That's exactly what big digital companies do, whether it's Google trying to figure out who to show an ad, what happens when they see the ad, et cetera, and where to place the ads based on people's right. queries to Amazon that's doing this with actual shopping. Yeah, right, right, exactly. So one thing that, and the real reason why we definitely wanted to have you on the podcast was because when you were speaking on the work that you did for ZipRecruiter um, about price optimization, and when you said, when you ended up in that room and they said they charged $99 a month, was it a month subscription mm -hmm. um, to utilize and have access to their database. Um, and you asked why $99? And they all looked at each other and they couldn't agree on why they came up with that price. I feel like that's 99% <laughs> of most companies out there that just go, well, I charge this amount because that's what I felt like. Definitely subscription services, it feels and, like it's and, just based yeah, off and of. Especially in your uh, tech fields where basically it takes you nothing to make that sale or make right, that. The cost, the the co cost the, of it is, right. is zero. But then there are other pricing methods out there too that are um, that you just do cost plus markup. And then they don't know how they got to the markup. And so what, right. you're, what you're doing with the price optimization is you know, taking that consumer data, which, by the way, seems like it's very valuable to everything, right? Um, and trying to trying to make sense of it using calculus and using economics to understand, like, okay, this is the actual optimal price, right? I've optimized right. this, and to actually, you know, come out and be like, listen, I like what you said too. It's like, uh, you know, come somebody come up to you and like, well, we made two billion dollars. It's like, well, how did you know you weren't supposed to make seven billion dollars? Yeah, exactly. Right? You're just guessing at that point. I've had, I've had, I've been with companies that 
don't actually understand how to phrase the question they want me to help them answer. So they, I'll be brought in, like we have a pricing problem. You start describing, you realize they don't even understand what's wrong with their pricing. They don't actually have a, a way to articulate what their pricing is. There's, there's a number, but there's no logic behind that number. So they can't even tell me why they think it might be wrong, except for, I guess, if you, if you sort of take this at a superficial level, how could it be right if you never put any thought into it, right? Right. Um, and, and, you know, as, as you were saying, in, in digital businesses, this is an even bigger wasted opportunity because it's basically every additional sale you get is incremental revenue, right? I mean, there's no marginal cost, I think is the, the term we would use in economics. There's no marginal cost from having one more person download a product that's already been created and is residing on your on your on your server. I mean, uh, barring you know capacity issues, you know bandwidth issues, you could basically sell unlimited quantities at no additional cost to the company. Right. And so you, you know you want to make sure you're managing your revenues around this. And it's funny to me is that those companies that have put inordinate amounts of effort into building teams of expert engineers, programmers operations and logistics folks and have optimized all the back office of the company and that have even optimized the product creation and content development itself, then basically, you know, sort of put like, you know, wet their finger, put it to the wind to manage revenues. And it's, I just find that odd. And, it, and I think it's just a matter of awareness that there's just not a lot of awareness that there are tools to help you manage pricing. Yeah, And that right. the tools are very basic things. Um, it's optimization. It is an optimization problem. Sometimes people will say, I don't want to see an equation. I go, well, I have news for you. That's what, <laughs> that's what setting price is. So, you know, you're going to have to just, you're going to have to suck it up a bit. And then yeah. once you look at that optimization, you realize, well, I'm not going to make any progress on this optimization problem unless I know demand. I mean, how mm. could I know the price I'm charging now is the best price unless I also could predict how much I would have sold at different prices? Right. Right. And if I can't, that, that, and that requires knowing demand, if I can't do that, then I have no way of knowing that my current price is anywhere close to being optimized. Right. Yeah. And I think that's that's the main block right there is that you could have, you'll go back and forth. And I think an entrepreneur natural instinct is to say, all right, well, I set the price here and I'm not selling as much as I'd want. So is that a problem with the product service or is that a problem with the price? And then you end up going like ping pong back and forth and you end up in no man's land. You're just like, I don't know. So usually what you'll do, right, is you'll change the price. You'll change the price to try to figure that out. But they're not doing it in a way that's scientifically sound so that they can actually test the two and say, you know, objectively, OK, well, um, you know, for a month we tried this price. And rather than going like, well, for one customer, we tried this price and one customer, we tried this price. But we tried for a month. And like, and to your point as well, it's like you need to have, you need to understand that demand, but that also means that you have to have the data points coming in to understand what the conversion rate was on any said price. Exactly, exactly. You need some testing. And you know, the reality is no company is gonna have its price perfectly optimized 100% of the time, but it's about being in the right ballpark, right? So, you know, and, and, and analytics have their flaws too. You know, you, we rely on models. The models may be imperfect or we rely on data. The data may have imperfections, but the idea is to try and triangulate and gut instinct can help you triangulate. But what I've always found odd is not that the lack of data, but even sometimes the almost explicit rejection of the data, like how dare you even question my gut instinct? Yeah, right. Um, you know, I, I, I worked with, I, I went, remember engaging with, a, it was bigger than a startup. It's a platform, a digital platform, I'll say about this company. And they were struggling with pricing as well. And, you know, I went through the same conversation I went through with the Workbox folks, Workbox folks and talked about how we could do this for, in their context. And when they, when they, we got to billing, um, they said, well, how much will this cost? They give them a number and they're like, they were just horrified. I mean, they thought I was going to do this for a few hundred bucks. I go, oh, sorry, this takes some work here. But what was really baffling was how little value they attributed to the cape of this possibility, even mm -hmm. though they'd started, they'd initiated this process saying they didn't know if they were monetizing their product. And we right. actually pointed a whole bunch of ways in which what they're doing was unvalidated. Um, that doesn't mean it was wrong, but it's just, it's unvalidated. I even suggested them, well, there's an easy way to solve this, which is instead of paying me an hourly rate, we can actually figure out what the incremental the incremental benefits to you will be. You can give me a percentage of that. We can do this like you know investment banking style, right? Don't mm. pay me for my hours work. Instead, I'll take a piece of whatever value I create for you. And they just looked at me like I was insane. Like our our board would never agree to that. <laughs> so 
so the end in the end they walked away they thought it was odd because part of this was me recommending price experiments. Like you do realize we have people at our company who've run experiments before. I go, okay. <laughs> but <laughs> it, 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 it was one thing to say I'd run an experiment. Tell me which one you'd run. Yeah, and right, they just right, looked right. at me. You don't know what your experiment to run. And how could you? Because you don't know what question you're trying to answer. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Exactly. But, but they uh, thought this funny. was, the, you know, somehow when you tell a company, I can save you a whole bunch of money by getting your costs down. That seems tangible. And people right. are willing to pay fortunes for that kind of logistical support. But when you get back to revenues, people just aren't trained to think revenues are something that require that much attention. Yeah, I think it has to do with a little bit on ROI, but the length of time to get to that ROI, which in your case is very short. I mean, yeah, right. you know, like you running an experiment like what you did with ZipRecruiter is a month and then you have time to analyze and then come up with what you, you know, your recommendation for the price setting is, and then you test it again. And then you come up with like, Oh, look at how much more like here proof done. Right. But when people like when cost cutting, I think can happen almost yeah. instantly. I mean, you already have the cost. So then cutting it away and showing how you're going to get rid of it. I think from a, from a standpoint of just looking at it, you're like, Oh, I can understand. Okay. But when it comes to like future growth, I don't know. It, it's so weird. It's a, it's this thing that we struggle with a lot on, in our own industry is talking to these, you know, talking to some companies and being like, OK, yeah, sure. You can continue to post up Facebook ads blanketly and everything and you'll get, um, you know, a thousand um, impressions, impressions on it or anything. Well, like we're trying to make something so that when you come up with a new idea, you understand the context it has to live in. We mm -hmm. understand the audience. And so this is going to have exponential growth right. and, in brand yeah. awareness and brand interaction, right? right. I don't even You're care right. about awareness. I want interaction. I want yeah. people coming back. I want people interacting yeah. with the content. And I want you know, people buying your product. The, you know, the foresight. Yeah, we got to remember one thing that made ZipRecruiter different from a lot of other companies, they have a rock star management team. And mm -hmm. what made them a rock star management team was their willingness to, to acknowledge before they even engage with us that they weren't sure what was going on with pricing. They wanted to fix pricing. And when they engaged with us, what made them unique was their willingness to run experiments that I'd never seen another company run. They tested prices that were so outside the norm of what they did. And the results were, well, they spoke for themselves. Um, yeah, right. they, this was, they, were, they were able to, in a very short amount of time to generate a significant increase in their profitability just by changing that number. You said something about cost being short term. This was a month. In one yeah, month's yeah. time, they were able to generate a 63% increase in the revenues. Right. Um, cost cutting, well, of course, there's always layoffs, these sort of blunt, these blunt instruments, but real cost optimization can take years. This is about automating mm. processes, mapping out the supply chain and figuring out how to like reorganize it to avoid bottlenecks, to allow for more throughput, reduce inventories in the process. These are things that take an inordinate amount of time. Revenue management solutions can actually be very quick. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, when you put it that way, then it makes even more sense. So now I'm struggling a little bit further to understand why people yeah. wouldn't want to do it. I feel it might maybe it's a little bit of ego, like how dare you <laughs> question my, what I think my price is worth. But well, not if they're already of, engaging. If they're already I actually, engaging, actually, I actually have a culprit. It's finance. Mm, okay, finance. Finance increasingly wants to get its hands into things that we would normally call marketing decisions, and pricing is one of them. So what mm. happens when pricing gets when when pricing gets delegated to finance and accounting? For them, this is just a margin. There's a markup of price over cost. That's the margin on each unit you get. They're cool. Well, we already we're all about margin, right? That's what finance and accounting work to then strive for. We we bring money into the company and then we 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 invest it into the operations, et cetera. And at the end of the year, we have a disclosure where we show people our net income, we show our gross margins, our net margins, et cetera. We're all about margin. And the result is they think of this as something that's really easy. Well, we have a margin target for this year, 50%. Cool. We'll set our markup to make sure we're getting a 50% margin. They go, wait a minute. That's not how pricing works. Mm -hmm. Because that whole approach, it sounds so simple, right? And that's how most companies manage those cost plus markups are aspirational markups that finance decided would be a satisfying rate of return to disclose to their stakeholders, except that it ignores the customer. Yeah. Because there's this thing called demand. If I, if, you know, if my margins look too small, I raise my price. That's not a free option to me. When I raise my price, I'm going to sell less. Yeah. So great. Your margin, your margin per unit sold went up, 
but your profitability is actually lower because you didn't sell as much. Or conversely, you know, you 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 figure your your you figure margins are great anyhow, but I want more market share. I'll just cut my price, right? Stakeholders said we want to be the empire. Cool, right? Lower the price, we'll get more market share. But meanwhile, all of the people who would have bought your product, even if the price had been much higher, are now still buying it. They're just paying less. Right. And this finance approach to marketing ignores the ignores customer. It ignores demand, and invariably gets the pricing wrong. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it just keeps sounding like we've been talking about this for a bit now. It sounds like what marketing has to do, and it really does need to be the double doors, right? It has to be able to absorb in all this data and then also be able to show, you know, on the pricing side, especially like what that optimal price is. Um, and that's just that's what the one quote that you um, that you had was marketing is the new finance. Right. Well, it wasn't your quote. It was somebody else's quote. I can't it's remember. It's Halvarian. Kind of I don't want to take Halvarian. Oh. That's Halvarian saying. It goes back yeah. over a decade. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. But that that's that's the truth of it, you know. And when you allow – and I think this comes back just to like old way of entrepreneurship being taught, right? So like when we were coming up with this tech idea, um, I the only thing I had was a business plan template. And that's all I knew about entrepreneurship. That was, that was it. Right. And so I filled it out. And one of the segments in the business plan is the financial model. Right. And so I'm like, well, how do how am I supposed to know what the demand is? How am I yeah. supposed to figure out and forecast, yeah. you know, what? And so I came up with some arbitrary price that made sense, that made us money, what I thought the cost was going to be for us. Right. Duh. That's just that's just the way that mo like logically speaking, that was the only thing I could possibly do. Right. But then when you go and when I joined Workbox and all those great mentors and everybody else there, and it's been a fantastic experience. Um, I end up learning about, you know, like the Steve Blank approach and going out and actually getting customer, you know, feedback and understanding what the actual pressure points are and talking before you build the product before you can. But it has to be the same thing with pricing, too. Because you can't just go out and just assume that even if you did listen to the consumers and everything, that you know what that price or what the price, their willingness to pay would be yeah. or what the entire market's willingness to pay would be. Right. Yeah, it and, can't be know. as simple as just asking people, How first of all, do you actually know? I mean, if I literally <laughs> wanted to derive a demand like super easily, I would go out and ask every customer, what's the maximum you would ever pay for this product? Do you actually know what that maximum yeah. is? Because I wouldn't know. And number two, <laughs> as soon as somebody asks me that question, I'm going to start thinking, hmm, I wonder what the, what the goal is here. Most likely, they want to set a price, so I should under-report. Right, Why yeah. would I ever tell you my <laughs> maximum willingness to pay if I suspect that the goal here is for you to set a price? But yeah, sure, I'd pay. You want me to know what I'd pay for an iPhone? Sure, I'd pay 50 bucks for it. <laughs> 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 so exactly. that's why this is where this is where even learning about demand is a scientific process and we have scientific methods not only to conceptualize demand but we also have scientific methods for thinking about how to get reliable data to measure demand yeah. and that's where and, and you know again this comes back to why aren't more companies managing revenues effectively why aren't they optimizing prices because there is this scientific component as well it is much easier to just say well, for the last 40 years, you've had a 50% markup. Like That's been your rule. If I keep doing that and things don't go well, I'm not going to get blamed because I'm just doing what everyone did. Remember, no one sure. gets fired for buying an IBM that didn't work. That saying doesn't even make any sense anymore, but it meant something <laughs> in the 80s. <laughs> right? um, you know, the same thing applies here. My incentives to experiment with something new or low because I'm in uncharted territory. What happens if I change the price and things go south? Even if it's not my fault, like maybe the market tanked, at the same time, all that's observed is I changed something and things went south. So I'm going to be, I'm going to take all the blame when it goes badly. And if things go fine, you know, well, okay. But at least if I kept doing what people were, were saying, you know, in some sense, the blame goes on inertia it goes on. This is the way the company does things. Right. I guess it was bad luck then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Fear, the fear of the fear of change, the fear of, of well, taking, and it's not even like really a risk though. Like you're doing an experiment. I mean, it's not, it's not like, yeah, know, well, but, but, it, oh. it, but once again, like, you know, what you said with it's the company's um, culture in a way yeah. of like, well, this is what we've done. Have Go you ahead. heard of the creative, the creative destruction? This is a, this goes back to Schumpeter at the beginning of the 20th century. You know, he was writing, especially in the interwar period in the 1930s, an Austrian economist, staunch defender of capitalism. But this was back in the days when people were thinking about capitalism for understanding macroeconomy and business cycles. 
And, you know, you've all heard of Keynes if you've taken economics because Keynes and stuff is taught in schools and whatever. We often don't learn as much about Schumpeter, but he had his own theory of, of, of business cycles, which had to do with entrepreneurialism. It was very, very micro found and it's very appealing. Um, his theory was very simple that business cycles arise because in a capitalist market like in America, where we have well functioning finance, we have property rights laws. And we have, and we also have an open market, a free market. Um, entrepreneurs take big gambles early in their life when they think they have a good idea in the hopes of building a successful business. Um, eventually they succeed, they become big. And we've seen lots of examples of these over the years, the Kodaks, the IBMs, for example, now the Amazons, right? They become very big, but monopolies become complacent. You do, you start to become more rigid. You do adapt to culture. And Jeff Bezos has said several times, um, Amazon will be dead by, you know, as eventually, Amazon will eventually die. You know, it's not going to be here forever, just like other big firms before it. Um, so, you know, and, you know, I think he has good historic reason for, for believing that. When it, when it will be dead, who knows? But again, companies become complacent and they start to fail. And that's how Schumpeter started thinking about the downturns. Downturns occur when big companies start to fail. And part of what makes them fail is that there are meanwhile new entrepreneurs coming in with better ideas to replace them. And yeah. this led to this concept of the creative destruction, which is that failure, business failure, for him was an integral part of capitalist markets. Mm. <clears throat> that it's because big businesses can fail that small entrepreneurs will continue wanting to build up their ventures because they're the ones who replace the big businesses. And as soon as businesses become too big to fail, yes, that's an adage I picked deliberately given the beginning of our conversation today. No, Once no. you become too big to fail, it, may, gives, it should give entrepreneurs pause. You know, right. if I have something better, <clears throat> do I have the same incentive to take a, a gamble with my life to launch this product and make, bring it to fruition? if I know that inferior established firms are ultimately going to be bailed out by the government. Yeah. That's so what I keep saying failures. about, yeah, that's what I keep saying about air travel, about yeah. airports or not airports, yeah. airlines, right? Airlines. It's like, how do we know? Like, like what, is, to your point, what's the incentive for an entrepreneur like, um, uh, who's the CEO of Virgin? Uh, Richard Branson. Brand. Richard Branson. Right. I when like he started. Brand, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> I was close. Yeah, Richard Branson. <laughs> when, when he started Virgin Airlines, right? I mean, they literally just had one plane. And his whole thing yep. was is that we're going to have better service than everybody else. And that's how exactly. we're going to. So if. if so he... analytics is analytics, data, and evidence based is not, maybe not the cause, but it's a big piece of the creative destruction we're seeing right now. Amazon was just. Is, 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 transforming retail and yeah. having a huge disruption. There's a certain irony that the, the Toys R Us type companies of the world think Amazon's very unfair when ironically Toys R Us was killing off mom and pop shops 30 years ago and for the same reason. They were, they were more efficient, they were bigger, they had better supply chain, but unfortunately they got complacent and Amazon became more evidence-based. They're making yeah. sure their products are made available and priced in the way that the consumers want. And yeah. so Amazon is just the next wave. What Amazon did that Toys R Us lacked was using data and optimizing their marketing mix at the front end of the business. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. And then the convenience of the whole thing, like there is not a tear being shed for Blockbuster. <laughs> No, None. absolutely. You know. But I would be very hesitant right now. I mean, there's a lot of angry sentiment towards Amazon, largely because the, the company grew during a pandemic. But we have to remember it grew during a pandemic because it was one of the most valuable things for the pandemic. Hmm. I mean, this was a company, I could get food delivered thanks to Whole Foods now. I can have food delivered in two hours yeah. without ever leaving the house. I never have to come into contact with someone. All my books for work, all of our household supplies, you know, Christmas gifts, there's really no need for me to go to a physical store thanks to Amazon. Right. And during a pandemic, what could be more valuable than this ability to circumvent those kinds of unnecessary physical interactions? Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. There has to, it's the, it, there has to be, there has to be that, that death, as you said, to, to yeah. these larger businesses to allow the new entrepreneurs, the wave yeah. to come up and, and come up with something new because that at the, at its core is capitalism, right? Well, it's right. it's the new and advancing forward of humanity. If there's no, and, you know, it, need if there's no opportunity to create something new, then we'll still be but, driving. You know, right. here's the amazing thing: over. Amazon Amazon doesn't charge monopoly prices. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they, people are scared that they're monopolizing big chunks of retail, but they don't charge monopoly prices. Bezos has been quoted many times saying 
yeah, we can do studies that say raise the price. We're not, you were not doing, we're not optimizing the price. But his goal is not to make big wins here, big wins there. His goal is to become a destination. You know, like it's if it's if consumers are paying low fair prices, and as a result, we go back and our loyalty is our loyalty is earned, right? He's not forcing us. Nobody's forced to shop at Amazon. But as you said, it's convenient, it's cheap, right? It's it's valuable. I can find what I need, so it's reliable, right? It's quick. So yeah. why wouldn't I just keep going back? And so because the value of Amazon on their end, the commercial value is a long-term play. It's not a quick monopoly play where they gouge us. Right, yeah. right, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, and when you put it like that, it, it does, it does, it would give a lot of people um, a bit of pause to, um, you know, not contradicting, what word am I looking for? Um, I don't know. It gives people pause from, it's like contradicting. Vilifying? It's like, yeah, vilify. There we go. Okay, but that's not the word. But that at least is a synonym to it. Okay. Vilifying Amazon, you know, just right off the bat because they made money and everybody was losing money, right? And then people couldn't eat and all this other stuff that was going on throughout the pandemic. Like Amazon was not the root of that. It, it's an easy boogeyman to point out, but it's not the root of the problem that actually happened. Um, Absolutely. Look at surge pricing on Uber. There's another one. People hate surge pricing on Uber. Isn't that gouging? Oh, well, it's interesting. There's a study they did um, with data where they could actually show what surge cut pricing at Uber actually accomplishes. And what they show is like, what's the one of the biggest surges of the year is going to be New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. On New Year's Eve, you know, people can, you know, it used to be that even with taxis, you could never get a taxi. Um, with Uber, before they had surge pricing, they had massive shortages, so you'd have to wait a considerably long time. So they ran a study in certain isolated markets where they were running the surge, and what they found during the surge was, yeah, the price spikes for about 15 minutes, maybe 10 to 15 minutes, it spikes. But in the meantime, drivers start getting in their cars at like, you know, 1245 at night and driving. Why? Because their hourly rate just went up by, by a lot. And mm -hmm. as more and more cars come in and start driving, the price goes back down again. What's the net result? The people have a very high willingness to pay for an Uber, a ration. They're getting the, when the cars are in short supply, the people who need a car the most can pay for it. Because you can always reject the car once you see the price. You're yeah, not committed yeah. to it. And so the net effect was the number of people with unfulfilled rides fell from, I forget what the percent, it was a really high amount. Like it was like 25 or 30% of people had unfulfilled rides to almost zero. I mean, they basically got rid of the scarcity. Yeah. Right. And for if I didn't want to pay like, you know, 3x for my car, fine. I had to wait 20 minutes until the price came down and then I could get my ride then. But the yeah, cool right. thing was that, you know, they rationed all the cars and, and incentivized more drivers to come out. So the price came down. But the most important thing is value to consumers is you don't stand outside in the snowstorm waiting for hours and hours for a taxi that's never going to show up. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that that totally yeah. and completely makes sense. Um, one last thing I did want to touch on before we let you go, um, sure. was the, was pri price optimization, but price customization, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, it's obviously it's very controversial because nobody wants to hit a paywall and see a price that's only destined to them, especially if you are of a wealthier background, you don't want to end up spending more money on a gallon of milk than mm -hmm. somebody else who doesn't make as much money on a gallon of milk. But there's 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 a lot of arguments to say that that's a good way of going about it, to your point, to get rid of food deserts or to allow people to, you know, not, not end up in prison because they can't pay a speeding ticket, yeah. you know? Like there's there's a reason to allow that to happen. I just wanted to get hear your thoughts and hear your a little bit of a rant on that subject. <laughs> So, so I think that what happens is we, we get too focused on equality of the opportunity, namely, should we all get charged the same, instead of equality of the allocation of value. And what price discrimination does in general is it should reduce inequality. Now, the problem is, um, does it reduce inequality in the way we want? I mean, after all, a company is not the tax authority. Their goal is not necessarily benign. So there could be perverse ways in which inequality is stimulated. For example, let's suppose people start gouging folks who are disadvantaged. It could go the opposite way, right? Right, right, right. That, you know, the reason somebody who's who's in a, in a very disadvantaged neighborhood may have a very high willingness to pay is precisely because you're their only option. You may be the yeah. only store in the neighborhood. If you go to a wealthy suburb, there's like six stores within quick drive, right? Right. So you, you end up raising the price for that person, that low-income neighborhood, and yes, 
granted, you are doing them a big service because you actually are there. Otherwise, they have nothing, right? So it's true that you're creating a lot of value, but we probably also argue it's not very fair once you think about net their overall income to put them into that position. And that's why we have right. the Consumer Protection Act. We, we, we do have protected classes clause for price discrimination. You can't discriminate on race. You can't discriminate your price on gender, for example, right? right. Um, but that was not notwithstanding, I think my concern is just this sort of view that per se, price discrimination will make people worse off is the problem. Mm. And I'm not sure why we think per se it will make people worse off. I mean, there, there, there are lots of cases where retail being one of them, it usually goes the other way around, that if we could price discriminate, prices would start to rise in the wealthy neighborhoods and would start to fall in the lower income neighborhoods. Your ability to do that would actually facilitate it launching stores in lower income neighborhoods because right. you would be allowed to charge prices people could afford to pay. Right. So, you know, it's just it's a funny starting point to just assume per se price discrimination is an evil weapon. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's just the the I think it's a branding issue on the term price discrimination. I feel oh, like that's, that, that's just not <laughs> no one wants to be discriminated against, even though it might end up helping you in the long that's right. run. This is why we have words like personalization, yeah, targeted right. price. We have targeting. We have zone pricing is what retailers call you know, most of their regional price differences. They call these zone pricing. Mm, yeah. It's like Dom Dominic's Fine Food used to have several price zones here in the city of Chicago. Most consumers wouldn't have noticed because we actually know way less about prices than we think. But the price <laughs> of a box of Tide detergent may have been very different from one store to another in Cook County. Really? Hmm. Yep. Huh. Well, you know, that makes sense. I mean, it's like it, it's 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 no different than rent being different prices in different neighborhoods. That's like, true. I don't understand why everyone's sure. like it's like it should be the same for everything. My, <laughs> Absolutely. my my one bedroom apartment in Bucktown should be the same price as a one bedroom apartment in Inglewood. It should right. be the exact same. Right. I mean, yep. that's what people assume people want for their milk. So that's what people want with their. Um, but yeah, no one what the market that. was willing to bear. Absolutely. Yeah. Or when you go to the, or when you go to the movie theater, you know, I'm 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 in my 40s. Right. So I pay the highest price they charge. If I mm. happen to be over 65 or under 12, I would have paid a much lower price for the same experience. <laughs> I think you, right. could, you could shake 12. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more likely to 65 with the gray hair. <laughs> you just go in there with a gigantic lollipop yeah, and right, a little exactly. spinner hat on. Right. There you go. And I don't know if that's 12, though. That might be like six. It, I don't know what era you're in. <laughs> Well, that's actually, ironically, what you're getting at now is one of the main reasons why we don't see widespread price discrimination. It's weird. It's like we're, we've, we've been focused on all the potential harms of price discrimination. But the big question is, why isn't there more of it? Because mm -hmm. if anything, I think the, the, the worries about it have been massively exaggerated because very few firms actually price discriminate. Most firms use a large degree of uniform pricing, or if they do price differential pricing, it's not on the same product. For example, I have a BMW 7 Series, a 5 Series, and a 3 Series. It's up to you whether you, you want more quality at a higher price or less quality at a lower price. That is also price discrimination. It's just right. a different approach to it. So that's the much more common approach. So why don't we see more personalized pricing as we, we called it earlier? And the answer is really simple. It's really hard to do. I need a mm. lot of data and analytics. That's, the, that's, the, that's just the ticket for the admission ticket to doing it. But even with that, if consumers find out they're gonna try and arbitrage this, and arbitrage is huge. I mean, in the in the supply chain, we know gray markets and other kinds of of uh, shady under dealings where customers buy at a low price in the low market and then resell in the high price market at a profit. Right. right? Mm -hmm. the, all these things undermine the efficacy of price discrimination. And then the third one, then, is what we've been talking about: is the PR backlash. The fact that you may be unreasonable, but you still think it's unfair, might be enough for a firm to say, "Forget it. I'm not even going to try." Mm -hmm, because if yeah. people think it's unfair, I don't want to have this new marketing campaign where I appear defensive about it, right? And say, listen, you guys are benefiting. If if you think it's unfair, then I don't even want to touch this thing. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Because then all of a sudden that would just be a nightmare. That would just yeah. be a nightmare. All of a sudden everybody will go, go to but, your... But arbitrage is huge. I mean, I've worked, in, I've worked with companies that have had cases where they're selling, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of equipment uh, into developing economies 
because they and where they charge lower prices because that's the that's the only way they can make progress in a developing economy and people in these small countries set up fictitious buyers with addresses and with licenses you know so the world works differently overseas and they'll buy large quantities of this product you know, you know half a million dollars worth of product and then they ship it back to the US and then sell it on places that are essentially eBay like platforms where they'll sell it at 20% below the domestic price Mm. Yeah, yeah, and you do see large buyers buying this stuff at these parallel at these at these gray market prices, and sometimes the the domestic company isn't even aware that this is a gray market price. They just assume this was an authorized seller. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right. You know, and yeah. similar things were happening with pharmaceuticals in Europe. So this is a very common problem, and that can be a good reason to just say, you know what, let's commit to one uniform price. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I don't know how. I'm wondering how you end up solving that solving that issue because well, I mean, I the benefits are so high. I feel like- So, so you see it more in services, right? Because it's yeah. really hard to arbitrage a service. So for example, yeah. airlines do this because the ticket isn't transferable to begin with, your name's on it, right? And you know, so, and I can't buy, it's really hard therefore for me, except the travel agent, I guess, to mm. buy bulk and then resell. Uh, movies, that's a service. Consulting, legal services. I can't buy yeah, yeah. a thousand hours of legal service from your law firm and then sell you know, 700 of it on the open market. So you see more price discrimination in the services industry than you do in the physical goods industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I was about to say that with a product, it's it's that you're always going to run that risk if you do price optimization or price personalization or right, yeah, price yeah. discrimination. No, absolutely, absolutely. Well, JP, this has been a fantastic conversation. Really enjoy talking to you. Um, we usually end off on some words of wisdom, something that kind of you know summarizes the conversation that we had anything else that you want to leave into leave into it or anything thoughts. else like that well no i think i think that the most important message you drove home in this conversation uh was twofold one was the importance of a well-functioning market but also understanding that as we intervene in markets such as limiting abilities of companies to buy other companies or limiting how firms set prices that that's not a free lunch either there's a there can be unintended consequences and we talked about whether or not it stifles innovation but we talked about free functioning markets and how that can be good for consumers in the long term and then we got into the role of marketing analytics that's my bread and butter uh, I teach the pricing class uh, at the, in the MD, to the MBA students at Booth. And so that's a really big part of marketing analytics. And the role of data and analytics for making marketing decisions, I think, is a part of how we understand the current creative destruction where we're seeing the rise of digital firms and the gradual decline of established firms. And I think this largely has to do with this willingness or lack thereof of adopting an analytics culture, an evidence-based culture. And as Macy's is shutting down several dozen stores, they just announced it. Amazon is expanding, including into the physical retail space. They're opening up Go stores, they're opening up Whole Foods, they're expanding Whole Foods. Apple has physical stores. So clearly physical retail isn't dead, but the, the identity of the key players may be changing. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, just another uh, um, on that, uh, the creative destruction. At one point, Sears commissioned the world's tallest building in Chicago. Yep. In oh. Chicago, and <laughs> now it's well, basically belly up. I think what some billionaire tried to bail it out, or something. yeah, uh, somebody tried to influx a whole bunch of money into it, and then it didn't didn't work. Clearly, uh, yeah. well, but, but you know, but, it's just that's just the ebb and flow of markets and companies that become established, and you know. Well, we've thought for a long time about technology as something that help, can help us be more efficient in the supply chain. And it's also something that can make our products better. Now we're realizing that technology can be a big part of what defines a company. And that includes mm. working by remote. Do we really need giant office towers to consolidate our workforce in one place? And it's yeah. looking like the answer might increasingly be no. Do we no. need dedicated office space for everyone? No, probably not. Right. And so the yeah. concept of a concept of a skyscraper starts to become, seem a little anachronistic. Well, they have a great club there. Yeah, at right. the nightclub. Yeah. That's great to go there for that. But no, I mean, we could go off on I mean, we, I've talked yeah. to a couple of real estate people and a lot of them are just turning a blind eye to that problem of like, are people going to come back? You might be getting paid now, but as soon as that lease comes up, I don't know. Like yeah, maybe they just need that meeting room every Friday. Right. Yeah. Well, now you get back to Workbox. So not to now we can end right. off the plug for Workbox. That's the whole idea: is that we do. We, does a smaller, medium-sized firm really need to own real estate or even to lease real estate? Probably not. You can go to flex office space like Workbox, 
And on top of getting the space at a, at a, at now what essentially is almost petty cash instead of capital expenditure, not quite, but almost, right? Mm -hmm. You also get access to a lot of, of, of fringe benefits, these scale benefits that a small size firm would normally not have, like yeah. um, leads in finance, leads in management, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it should be a big year. I'm looking forward. You know, uh, John was talking about on the call yesterday about the like um, some new new happenings going on. So excited to see that, and and, and yeah, hopefully, absolutely. hopefully we'll be hopefully we'll be together again soon. On Sounds that great. note, yeah, I look forward to meeting you in person. Um, at some point, I'm sure Workbox will have a big thing, and I'm sure John will invite you to come along. <laughs> and, absolutely. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll have a beer and whatever, but yeah, craft um, beer, right? Yeah, yeah well, course, obviously, of course, craft beer. <laughs> and not Goose Island. Yeah, right. <laughs> they sell they sold out. <laughs> uh, I, I, some I'm partial to the, I'm partial to the to the Three Floyds. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, all right, yeah, I like that. Yeah, well, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, you know what? That was one thing that always struck me really interesting about John was that he did have like that keg of beer at Workbox too mm -hmm. that changes you know, on a, on a regular basis. And he's, he's kind of, pretty that's good. not for, that's not for you guys. That's just when his, his, his MBA friends show up at the office that he can show them. He's, he's still cool. Even though he's a dad working, <laughs> like working a hundred hour weeks that he's still cool. This keg yeah. is the last remnant <laughs> of the days as a, as a swinging student. Well, what a great conversation. I mean, it never ceases to amaze me. These amazing people we get to have conversations with, like JP, who's moving the needle on price optimization. If you're not optimizing your price, you're probably leaving money on the table. That's just true. And if you want more great conversations, we have plenty of them. And if you want to just hang, hang out and have a cocktail with us, you can join Sipulations for a new episode every Friday. Enjoy, guys. Thanks for your support. <laughs>